So um, these are um, high dimensional optimization problems where the objective comes from random data. So this includes constraint satisfaction problems like random KSAT, as well as more kind of mean field models like the mixed beast and glass. And these problems are often challenging from both perspectives of designing good algorithms and showing good hardness results. So on the algorithmic side, the challenge is that the landscapes are often very non-convex. Um, so um, this suggests that algorithms like gradient descent won't be enough. And on the hardness side, um, classical techniques like NP hardness reductions um, are often overly pessimistic because they tend to capture the worst case behavior of these problems, which might not be representative of the average case. So that leads us to our guiding question. Um, what are the computational limits of random optimization problems? In this talk, we'll focus on uh, one model, uh, mean field spin glass. So these are um, polynomials with IID Gaussian coefficients. So for example, you can consider a random cubic in n variables where you write down all n cubed monomials of degree three, um, put a Gaussian in front of each one and add them up. So this is maybe the most random cubic you can think of. Um, we'll write this compactly like this. So G3 here is a three tensor that, cap that um, carries the n cubed uh, disorder of Gaussians. Um, more generally, um, we can take linear combinations of this construction over different degrees. So for every degree P, you do this construction. Um, then these numerators are constants that determine the relative uh, weights of different degrees. And these denominators simply normalize different degrees to contribute on the same scale. Um, so that's your random polynomial. And our goal will be to optimize this polynomial over a sphere of radius root n. Um, a quantity that will appear a lot in, uh, whenever you're talking about these spin glasses is this mixture function, which is a sort of generating function of the gamma squared. So for example, for this cubic, this is just q cubed. Um, and this shows up because um, this polynomial can be thought of as a Gaussian process whose covariance is, um, is determined by this mixture function. Um, yeah, so these models originated in statistical physics to study certain diluted magnetic alloys, but have since uh, seen connections to both uh, probability and computer science. So one reason we'll care about them is that they're a clean example of a random optimization problem. And uh, this makes them a natural sandbox for understanding the computational properties of these problems, maybe more generally. There's also direct connections to specific random optimization problems. So if you consider random constraint satisfaction problems like max cut and max set, take a large constraint density limit and appropriately recenter and rescale, you end up with exactly this um, mean field model. Now with any random optimization, uh, right, so, um, this limit is the lim is um, an easing uh, type of spin glass, but in this talk we'll we'll talk about spherical. Um, yeah. So with any random optimization problem, there's two basic questions you can ask. You can ask what's the largest value that exists, and what's the largest value that an efficient algorithm can find. For this model, the uh, the first question is very well understood. So the maximum value is given by the famous Parisi formula, which was the result of uh, several decades of work. Um, in this talk, we'll be interested in the algorithmic question. So suppose you are an efficient algorithm and someone hands you some uh, description of H, like a list of the internal Gaussians. And your job is to output a point uh, sigma on the sphere where H of sigma is big. How well can you do? Um, this problem has both uh, challenging properties that I mentioned earlier. So these landscapes are uh, very non-convex uh, with exponentially many bad local maxima appearing well below opt. And this suggests that um, gradient descent won't be enough. And on the hardness side, um, worst case lower bounds are indeed overly pessimistic. Um, our main result will be a computational threshold for this problem for a class of Lipschitz algorithms. So here we're thinking of an algorithm um, as a map from the disorder Gaussians to R to the N, and we're asking that this map is um, suitably Lipschitz. 
So this class of algorithms includes the best algorithm we know for this problem. Um, and we showed that no Lipschitz algorithm can uh, surpass this value alg. Um, our result also holds for a yet more general um, model of multi-species thin glasses, which um, we'll cover towards the end. Um, so Lipschitz algorithms include many of our favorite algorithms like gradient descent, Langevin dynamics, approximate message passing, and in fact, any constant word or method uh, for constant time. Um, this does not yet include low degree polynomials or sum of squares algorithms. Um, and if you have ideas for showing hardness for these classes of um, computation, uh, let me know, I'd be very excited. Um, but let me say, I do think that um, it's there is hope for um, generalizing this hardness result to larger classes of computation. So our proof of hardness um, actually works for um, algorithms with a more general overlap concentration property. And Lipschitz is only used to get overlap concentration. Um, you'll see what I mean in a few slides. Um, the proof of hardness goes through the overlap gap property. This is a framework introduced by Gamarnik and Sudan, which um, turns clustering properties of the solution space to rigorous hardness for uh, algorithms that are suitably stable in the input. Um, this has been used to show hardness in a lot of random optimization problems um, by many people in this room. Um, and this framework um, formalizes clustering as an overlap gap. So the overlap of two states is their normalized inner product. And the overlap gap is the condition that any two um, sufficiently high value states cannot have a medium overlap. So in other words, any two such states either have big overlap, which means they're close together, or small overlap, which, which means they're far apart. Um, let's now see why this ought to imply hardness. Um, this argument is due to Gamarnik and Sudan, and in light of later work, we call this the classic OGP. So the argument goes, suppose a stable algorithm can reach some value E, then we show somehow that this can be used to construct not just one point of value E, but a pair of points um, with this value and medium overlap. Um, on the other hand, by the overlap gap property, um, such a pair can't exist, so then by contradiction, um, the algorithm cannot reach this value E. And this framework has been uh, quite successful at uh, showing hardness above some intermediate value between alg and opt. Um, so it shows that in this middle right region, these objectives, even though they exist, are hard for algorithms to find. Um, and the natural next question is, well, what about this middle left region? And can we show hardness closer to ALG? An idea that's gotten a lot of mileage is the multi-OGP, where we uh, kind of run the same argument, but with a more complicated forbidden structure. Um, and over many works, um, this has um, pushed a hardness closer to ALG in many random optimization problems. And in the problem of maximum independent set, um, in two very nice papers by Ramon Virag and by Alex Wein, uh, they actually are all the way to ALG in the maximum independent set problem. So that leads to the question, well, in this model, can we get all the way? And the message of this talk is, uh, yes, we can, using a uh, new uh, version of the multi-OGP, which we call the branching OGP. So this uses a new forbidden structure, which represents a sort of hierarchical type of clustering. Um, so uh, we can now state the main result. So the best algorithm we know for this problem is due to Subag, and it finds points with this value shown here. Uh, so remember, psi here is the mixture function. Um, two years ago, we showed that if the model is even, so if there's no odd degree interactions, then uh, Lipschitz algorithms cannot surpass ALG. And uh, this gets the right answer for even models, but the proof is uh, somewhat brittle. So the proof, um, the way we show that this uh, forbidden structure doesn't occur is using um, a tool called Guerra's interpolation. Um, and this tool um, relies on convexity properties of the problem in a very crucial way. So when these properties don't hold, the entire proof goes out the window. Um, but in recent work, we were able to remove this even assumption and show that uh, this value alg is the um, 
computational threshold for all Lipschitz algorithms. And uh, the key tool here is a new proof of the branching OGP, which uh, does not use Guerrero's interpolation. Um, this proof is both simpler and more robust and works just as well um, in the more general model of multi-species uh, spin classes. In fact, um, in these multi-species models, the value opt is not always known um, for the same reason that Guerrero's interpolation fails. So this is the first model where um, the value alg is known before the value opt. So um, we're, we're thinking of an algorithm as a function. So like your algorithm gets um, the list of disorder Gaussians, and from that it outputs a point. And we're just asking if this map is Lipschitz. Okay. So next, um, let's introduce Subog's algorithm to optimize the spin class this will play an important motivational role in our proof of hardness. So this algorithm starts at the origin and kind of explores its way outward to the surface of the sphere. Here, delta is a small constant step size. And the algorithm does the following. Each step, it computes the top eigenvector of the tangential Hessian. So this is the Hessian, but with the direction um, parallel to your current position at xt zeroed out. And then it takes a little step in that direction and repeats. Um, so note that the step vt is always orthogonal to the position xt. So this is kind of moving by little orthogonal steps and zigzagging its way outward. Um, and then because of this orthogonality, um, every step, your squared radius goes up by the same amount. So after a fixed number of steps, you land on the outside sphere and you output that point. Um, it can be shown that this algorithm attains the value alg that I showed, um, and that it can be implemented in a Lipschitz way. Um, I won't really say how. So now let's turn to the proof of hardness. Um, the protagonist of this proof is this new forbidden structure, uh, which is called an ultrametric tree. So this represents a hierarchically clustered uh, set of points. So on each leaf of this tree is a point uh, in the constellation. And the tree um, kind of prescribes the hierarchical clustering. Um, so every pair of siblings in this tree has the same overlap. Um, every pair of cousins has the same overlap, which is smaller than the sibling overlap, and so on. And you can kind of see how this um, gives you clustering in a hierarchical way. We think of um, the branching uh, factor k and the depth d both as big constants. Um, and these overlaps as uh, the multiples of uh, 1 over d. So this is kind of a densely branching tree. Um, and we're going to argue, on the one hand, that if a Lipschitz algorithm attains value e, then it can be used to build an ultrametric of points uh, with this value. Um, with respect to a correlated Hamiltonian ensemble that I'll introduce in a second. And on the other hand, that uh, such a constellation does not exist with value more than ALG. And together, these imply that Lipschitz algorithms can't surpass ALG. So let's first see why a Lipschitz algorithm can construct such a tree. Um, let's, so we suppose a Lipschitz algorithm attains value E. Then the starting point of this argument is this uh, tree of hierarchically correlated Hamiltonians. Um, so on every leaf of this tree is a Hamiltonian, which is um, marginally a copy of the original Hamiltonian. And uh, they'll be correlated in a similar hierarchical way. So every pair of siblings has the same correlation, and every pair of cousins has the same correlation, which is smaller than the sibling correlation, and so on. Um, now we apply the algorithm to each Hamiltonian to get a tree of points. And the key observation is that by Gaussian concentration of measure, um, the overlap between any pair of points on the right concentrates. So um, let's consider, for example, uh, these leftmost two points. Um, because this algorithm is Lipschitz, 
uh, this overlap is some Lipschitz function of Gaussians. So, okay, this concentrates near its mean. And this is the only place that we're using Lipschitz. So this argument works for any algorithm with this type of concentration property. Um, but what does this mean? It's some number depending only on uh, the, the correlation, P1, of the underlying pair of Hamiltonians. So this is some number um, depending only on P1. Let's call it Q1. And any pair of siblings on the right will therefore have um, overlap concentrated around Q1. And similarly, any pair of cousins on the right will have overlap concentrating around some value, um, which we call Q0, uh, for the same reason. So this um, operation of apply the algorithm to each Hamiltonian turned this hierarchically correlated tree of Hamiltonians to this um, ultrametric tree of points. Um, and this map from correlations to overlaps, uh, we call it chi, uh, is some property of the algorithm. Now, this map is, this chi map is also kind of clearly continuous. So um, if we pick the correlations on the left correctly, then we can get whatever overlaps on the right we want. Uh, namely, we can get this densely branching overlaps that we wanted. So finally, um, because the algorithm attains value e, um, each point on the right plugged into its corresponding Hamiltonian gets value at least E. So we've constructed this um, constellation of points with the desired geometry where each point attains value E in some Hamiltonian. Okay. So, um, I mean, it, how do you actually get bounds on like what Q1 and, I mean, so it seems like, okay, the algorithm is Lipschitz, mm -hmm. so then um, you get some control that uh, the correlation but it seems hard to know what it concentrates to. Uh, right. So we get some control over the Sky function because it turns out to be convex. Okay. Um, and you, you can kind of see this by uh, Fourier expanding, or her Hermite expanding this, um, this function. Um, and then this is enough to get the control that we need. As, as long as there are. Yeah. 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 So we got some. Yeah. So for every algorithm, there is some tuple of P's that for which this is true. Yeah, so the fix large constant depth and branching factor and fix these um, these overlaps to be. Yes. Uh, oh yeah, I, I kind of covered that up, but yes. Um, so the, if you want to formalize this, now for any epsilon, um, there exists a uh, big enough K and D so that um, uh, so that this structure does not exist with value out plus epsilon. Okay, so now we've kind of constructed this structure. So if we can show the following claim, then we'll be done. Um, the claim is, so for any constellation um, <coughs> sigma with this um, ultrametric shape, if you um, plug each sigma into its corresponding h and average, uh, this will be at most alg. Um, because on the one hand, from the previous slide, we know that each of these numbers will be at least e. So then this shows that um, e is at most alg. Um, yeah, so the way we're going to prove this is um, by arguing that the best possible way to construct this um, ultrametric tree is to do so greedily. So first, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to pretend that all these Hamiltonians are the same instead of being correlated. Um, we'll fix this in the end. 
Um, and then we're going to construct this constellation in the following way. Um, we can consider a branched version of Subog's algorithm. So um, in Subog's algorithm, each step we, we took a top eigenvector and walked along that direction. Well, now instead we'll take the top k eigenvectors and uh, kind of advance along all k directions simultaneously. And this gives you a multi-valued algorithm. And maybe it's not hard to believe that this um, branched algorithm will output a constellation of points with this, um, with this ultrametric shape because kind of the overlap of two of the outputs will kind of depend on the height where they diverged. Um, and by the same analysis as in Subog's algorithm, um, all these outputs will get a value about alg. And in particular, uh, this average evaluation of this Hamiltonian on this, uh, on this constellation will be about alg. And this tree is built greedily because each step we're just um, taking the best couple directions to advance. And we're going to argue that this is kind of the only sensible way to construct this tree um, by saying that there's no way to plan ahead. And we're going to formalize this notion of you can't plan ahead uh, using a uh, uniform concentration lemma. So the uniform concentration lemma concerns uh, configurations of uh, k plus one points with the following shape. Um, here I've drawn a little sphere of radius root qn and a big sphere of radius root q prime n, both living inside the main sphere of radius root n. Now the point x will lie in the little sphere, and the points x1 through xk will lie in the big sphere. Um, we, th we think of x as kind of the parent, and x1 through xk as kind of the children. And we require these points to satisfy an increment orthogonality condition that um, the increments from x to its children are orthogonal to each other and orthogonal to x itself. So if you, if you consider some step in the branched Subog algorithm, um, this is exactly the shape satisfied by some point and the points you get from it. And then the lemma concerns the following function. So for any x on this little sphere, um, you maximize over all children configurations satisfying this increment orthogonality of um, this improvement in value when you go from x to its children. The uniform concentration lemma says that if the branching factor k is big, then uh, f concentrates near its mean and the quality of the concentration is uniform. So uh, the last bit is the important part. So simultaneously for all x on the little sphere, um, f concentrates near its mean. Um, maybe I'll say a few words about the proof. So for a single x, um, this inside quantity is some um, average of orthogonal Gaussian increments. So you can imagine that as k gets bigger, this will concentrate better. And when k is big enough, this will concentrate so well for a single x that this uh, claim follows by just union bounding over a suitable epsilon net of the little sphere. For us, the meaning of this lemma is no x on the little sphere is unusually good or unusually bad for building a tree. Because no matter where you are on the sphere, uh, thanks, uh, the number of uh, the best possible improvement you get to your children is the same, so uh, you might as well construct the tree greedily. And um, we'll see that the average value of this constellation can be upper bounded um, by a uh, sum of these uh, apparent children increments, which uh, look like f of x. So we have this um, constellation of um, points uh, that look like an ultrametric tree. And we can define sigma u for u uh, indexed by interior nodes of the tree by just taking uh, recursive barycenters. And it turns out that these points will satisfy approximately this um, increment orthogonality relation. So this is satisfied by any uh, point and its children. So now we want to upper bound this average evaluation of the Hamiltonian. And we write this as a sum of these uh, parent to children claw increments. So this is a claw, this is a claw, and this is a claw. Um, and you know, each of these is exactly upper bounded by this function f that we defined. And this gives us control of this, um, of this quantity. Um, because by uniform concentration, um, each of these f is upper bounded by its expectation, which is some uh, deterministic number. And by just adding up these upper bounds, we get to upper bound this, um, this average energy of the tree. And these bounds will match exactly the progress that the greedy algorithm makes in that step. 
so we end up with ALG. Uh, the fact that these match the greedy algorithm is, uh, it kind of says that if we didn't know Subog's algorithm, uh, from this proof of hardness, we're able to recover Subog's algorithm as the algorithm that's doing what the inequality tells you to do. Um, so really, the algorithm and the OGP are now the same thing. Um, and finally, I owe you uh, one thing, which is um, in the beginning, we cheated and pretended all the Hamiltonians are the same. Um, with correlated Hamiltonians, we have to bound a similar um, sum of these claw increments, and we can do this with a uh, slightly more general version of the uniform concentration lemma, but um, everything works. So that upper bounds um, this tree value and uh, completes the proof of the branch LGP. Now, I guess I don't have much time left, but maybe I'll say a little bit about multi-species models. Um, up to now, we've considered uh, random polynomials where all the variables kind of look the same. So the x1, x2 uh, coefficient looks the same as the x1, x5 coefficient. And multi-species models um, generalize this by allowing a constant number of different variable types. Um, so we partition one through n into a bounded number of species, uh, where each species accounts for a fixed fraction of the coordinates. And now instead of um, you know, multiplying each Gaussian coefficient by a weight that depends only on the degree, we now allow these weights to depend on uh, the, the tuple of species participating in that monomial. And uh, we'll want to optimize this over a product of spheres, one sphere for each species. Um, it turns out that with, in the multi-species setting, our algorithms get a little more uh, flexibility. So um, Subog's algorithm started at the center of the sphere and kind of zigzag zigzagged its way outward. But now when we optimize on a product of spheres, um, we can advance through the different spheres at different speeds. So if you have two spheres, then uh, the number of ways to, ex to explore outward is given by a sort of radius schedule, which is an upright path from 0, 0 to 1, 1. And in general, this is a path from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1. Um, and for each path, there is a um, analog of Subog's algorithm, which takes little orthogonal steps in each of these spheres and kind of synchronizes the step sizes so that you're overall advancing through the spheres with schedule given by this phi. And we can calculate that um, the Subog algorithm given by this uh, phi attains value this functional of phi. Um, so our result for multi-species models is that um, the algorithmic threshold is this um, functional for the best possible radius schedule. Um, so there's a Lipschitz algorithm which kind of generalizes Subog's algorithm which attains this value and no Lipschitz algorithm surpasses it. Uh, there's a slightly more general result with external fields. And finally, um, even though we don't start out with much regularity in this variational problem, we're able to show that this formula has a maximizer, which also satisfies an explicit ODE. Okay, so let me wrap up. Um, so we determine the algorithmic threshold for uh, this uh, multi-species spin glass model for uh, Lipschitz algorithms. Um, and this points to a geometric description of the algorithmic threshold um, as the largest value whose super level set contains this densely branching ultrametric tree. So the story that's emerging is when this tree exists, uh, an algorithm like Subog's algorithm is able to follow a root to leaf path of this tree. And when this tree doesn't exist, then the branching of GP implies hardness. Um, yeah, thanks for your attention. So um, for stochastic algorithms, um, the hardness result works if the algorithm is kind of stable per seed. So like if with, with high probability over the random seed, um, you, know, you kind of fix the random bits of the algorithm and the, that resulting deterministic algorithm is, sta is stable, then, then this works. But here, 
it for anything like on this game. With the instant fix, right? Because yes. there's an extra side seed that then yes. stability of each side seed. Uh, yeah, I, sorry, I, I don't think I understood the question. So are, are you asking like if the levels if if I asked for a lower level set then? Uh, oh yeah. yeah. I see. Um, right. So I guess this old one Lipschitz um can probably be made to be slightly growing. Um, we haven't worked out how you know slowly growing this can be like probably log 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 is fine. <laughs> but like the reason is when we prove this branch in OGP, there's kind of like there's like three nested numbers that are going to zero and like, you know, t turning this into something quantitative is um is a little hard. Like, what's an example of a geometry you have in mind? Good question. So, um, okay, clicking back is okay, maybe easier if I do it here. Um, right. So, like, really, we only use this property of overlap concentration. So, maybe you, like, I guess I'll interpret your question as are low degree polynomials overlap concentrated? And the answer is uh, no, but with an asterisk. So, um, here is an example of a low-degree polynomial that is very clearly not overlap concentrated. You know, you receive some list of Gaussians and you just output the first one in all your coordinates. Uh, this will definitely not be overlap concentrated. Um, but also, this polynomial is kind of clearly not doing anything. Um, so one possible uh, strategy for showing this, which um, I haven't tried, is um, maybe there's a way to say um, all like any low degree polynomial is a sum of something that's clearly not doing anything and something that is overlap concentrated, perhaps. <laughs> 